Well, thanks very much, everyone, for being here for this third event that we have put together. If I can now ask Frank Horsman. OK, so uh, Barbara and I installed a ground source heat pump. Uh, and in order to show you the, uh, the, the path, as it were, I think it's quite necessary to explain how one works. So I make no apology for this because the, the working of a ground source heat pump um, is really, you need to understand it to, to understand the limitations and design constraints and also the choice of heat pump. Um, so, how on earth can you get heat from the ground at 10 degrees and use it to heat your house to 20 degrees? It doesn't really make sense. Uh, completely counterintuitive. It's either a, a confidence trick or magic. That's what people tend to, to think. So, to explain how, how it does work, um, and that it not only makes sense, but it's cr crucial to our fight against man-made climate dis disruption. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm going to share my screen to show you a diagram of a a ground source heat pump. Oh, that's come up. Oh yeah, got to double click. Um, yeah, so everybody probably noticed that if you if you use a little pump to pump up a bicycle tire, and you put lots of energy into it, it gets hot. The pump gets hot. If you compress a gas, it gets hot. So we can actually make this effect far greater if we choose a gas that under the conditions will condense. Um, obviously a liquid takes up far less volume than a gas and therefore we really are compressing it if it condenses and what we get out is called latent heat, latent heat of condensation or evaporation, it's the same thing the other way around. So we use this effect in, the, in our heat pump. What you can see, I hope on your screen, is uh, a diagram of the basic, um, I don't know, can you see the, um, the arrow that I'm, no, it doesn't matter. Yes, yes we can. We okay. Can. Uh, yeah, on, on the uh, bottom of this diagram, uh, you see a compressor. So that's like your bicycle pump. It's compressing the gas. So you end up with a hot gas. And when you take the heat out of that gas, it will condense. And of course, in taking the heat out and it condensing, you get more heat out. So you get lots of heat out of this. Not only does it cause it to condense, but you can transfer the heat from it in what's called a heat exchanger to your central heating system. Okay, so the problem is, of course, you can't, that, or the, I should say that the gas that will condense under those conditions, you choose a gas that will do that most effectively, of course, and, and that's called a refrigerant because it, it's just, it's the same stuff that, that's used in fridges. In fact, heat pumps and fridges are the same thing. Um, so you can't just feed in more and more refrigerant to replace the, uh, the refrigerant that's been compressed, obviously. So you need to get it back to the same conditions so that it can go around the cycle again. So at the... Uh, at the top of this diagram, you'll see that there's um, something labeled uh, an expansion valve. 
it's just a small orifice and the pressure behind the compressor pushes the warm liquid through this tiny hole into a low pressure area and it will then form a vapor. Now, to get the heat into this vapor to, so that you can get it to the same state again, you need something warmer, but it is very cold now. So your heat, your, your water from outside can transmit heat into that. The heat will flow from say 10 degrees C, the, the groundwater, into the um, into the uh, refrigerant. So that becomes uh, a gas, which is fairly cool, but then that can be fed into the compressor and the whole thing starts again. So this refrigerant is just a transmission, if you like, uh, whereby you can extract heat on one side and put heat in at the other. As I said, a fridge is, is exactly the same. In fact, uh, our heat pump was made by a company who started with refrigerators. And if you can imagine the, um, the fridge as the, the gray area in this diagram, then the fridge is exactly the same thing. If you remove the heat exchanger on the right out of the fridge into the room, then the heat can be dissipated in the room and the water, the, the outdoor water flowing into the left hand side is actually replaced by the fridge contents. So just as you're taking water from the outside, um, you are you just take heat progressively from the, the fridge contents and they get cooler and cooler. So it is it is exactly the same thing on a different scale for a different purpose. Now you, you tend to hear people say, well, yeah, if it, heat pump is just a fridge working backwards. Well it's not 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 really the case because as I've just shown, it's exactly the same thing. They're both wo working in the same direction. The difference is that the, um, the distribution of the uh, heat exchange is, is different. And that's, that's all there is. What is truly opposite, working in the opposite direction, is not a fridge, but a heat engine, a car engine, steam engine, whatever. Because a heat engine is doing work uh, I'm sorry, is burning fuel, producing heat, which does work, drives your car, drives the steam engine. What we're doing with the heat pump is we're doing work to produce heat. So it's ex exactly the same thing in the opposite direction. Now, in the 19th century, a lot of work was done on heat engines and it was shown that there is a limitation to the amount of heat that you can get for a given amount of work that you do. So, and this is absolutely fundamental physics. It gives a ceiling, you cannot exceed that ceiling. No matter how much work you do, you will only get a certain amount of heat from that work per you know, per kilowatt hour that you put in. So our electric motor on the heat pump does the work, drives the compressor, and there's a limit. There's a limitation to the amount you can get. Now that theoretical limit, rather than giving you any formulae, burdening you with that, I've, I've worked out a couple of examples if your central heating runs at 60 degrees C and your outdoor temperature is 10 degrees C, your groundwater is at 10 degrees C, then the theoretical maximum, the, the ceiling, if you like, 
is 6.7 times, the heat is 6.7 times the work that you do. So that would potentially give you a 670% efficient heat pump. Unfortunately, um, there are other things that come into the efficiency. Uh, friction in the heat pump, the fact that the refrigerant isn't a perfect gas and lots of other things, electrical resistance. And I've seen, you know, I've worked out a few examples on this and it seems to me that there's a rule of thumb that you get about a third of the, this theoretical ceiling. What that means is if you, if you run your, uh, central heating system at 60 degrees C, giving you a ceiling of 6.7, a third of that is about 2.2. So you only get about 2.2. It's called the um, coefficient of performance, COP. So you only get 2.2 times more heat than the work that you put in, i.e. The, the electricity that you use in driving the compressor. Now, it so happens that um, Ofgem regard anything below 2.5 as not renewable energy. So running your central heating at 60 degrees C would not be classed as renewable, renewable energy by Ofgem. Right, take another example. Supposing you manage to drop the temperature of your central heating system to 35C, then I worked out that the, the ceiling would be 12.3 as opposed to 6.7. A third of that, using the rule of thumb, is 4.1. So there you get 4.1 times as much heat as electricity that you get. So it's effectively multiplying your electrical energy by a factor of four. Um, now I've got another slide here somewhere. Yeah, so in this graph you see that, um, that this, is, this was supplied by the company that made our heat pump and the one that we've got, you you see that if you went down to twenty, you'd you'd get um, a COP of six, but unfortunately you can't run your your heating at twenty because the heat wouldn't come into your room. Thirty five is it seems a fairly typical example, and if we look at thirty five central heating temperature then that indeed gives us COP of, 40, um, of four. So we get four times as much heat as the electricity that we put in. So that's one consequence of this um, thermodynamic ceiling. Um, reduce your central heating temperature. You can do that and we've done it. We've put in underfloor heating and you can also use oversized radiators. If you look at the heat output of radiators in table, um, they give the heat output uh, assuming 70 degrees. So we're not going to do anything like that with our heat pump. Uh, and we were told by our installer when we decided to this on the size of radiators to multiply the heat output by, I think it was 0. 0.406. So we had to choose big radiators um, upstairs. We had underfloor downstairs. And um, so you, you've got a big area. So the heat output can be the same as was for your normal conventional radiators at a higher temperature. So that's one thing you do, you can do if you've got heat pump. 
The other consideration is um, the temperature of the outdoor source of heat. And that really determines the design and the choice of a heat pump. Now, obviously in winter, the source of heat is going to be a lot lower, um, certainly for an air source heat pump. And because the difference between the source and your central heating temperature determines the efficiency, um, you really want to arrange so that the, um, the source temperature is as high as possible. You want that difference, the lift in temperature to be as small as possible to, to achieve good efficiency. So um, it has connotations obviously for closed loop systems, closed loop ground source heat pumps, because there you push the liquid down into the ground and it comes back up in a continuous closed loop. Um, now, of course, what will happen there is that the heat pump will take the heat out of the water, which then goes back down into the ground in the closed loop, and it'll cool the ground. So that if you don't get enough heat to replace that coming in from the ground, it'll just get colder and colder. Uh, so, you know, this is obviously a crucial factor in the design of the heat pump system. I heard a story of a guy in South Wales who designed his own closed loop ground source heat pump system, um, put it in his back garden and froze his back garden solid permanently when he was running the, uh, the heat pump. So it just shows how important the, uh, the design is. Okay, thanks. Could we, you be wrapping up, Frank? Okay, we had an open loop um, pump, um, and that just takes water out of uh, the aquifer under under the ground at ten degrees, and it stays at ten degrees all the year. So that difference is not reduced. So um, yeah, I'll I'll wrap up. Uh, I just wanted to say that. Um, in setting up the system, we've we found many delays, difficulties, and frustrations, which I can detail in the break breakout group if required. But um, we don't regret having this system. Um, if we didn't have enough space for boreholes, I would look at air source heat pumps, and there is a, a, a renewable heat incentive available, and not and a, a domestic which runs out next March. So if you're thinking of it, it is a good investment. Uh, so it, it's worth looking at that. And I'd, I'd just like to finish by quoting from uh, the late Professor David McKay, who has produced a brilliant book on the internet. Look it up if you if you haven't seen it. It's called Renewable uh, sorry, uh, sustainable energy without the hot air. And it really is very good. And just a quote from that book to finish. Um, so he says, These heat pumps are four times more efficient than any other winter heating method. Show me a better choice. Wood pellets? Sure, a few wood scavengers can burn wood, but there's not enough wood for everyone to do so. For forest dwellers, there's wood. For everyone else, there's heat pumps. Thanks, sorry to run over. Thanks ever so much, Frank. And indeed, for the uh, for the final quote for all of those who uh, would like to think that a wood burning stove is going to be the answer to their to their problems. <laughs>